And we're live. Well, good morning, everybody. And what a big treat. Um, very difficult to introduce some people because their bios are so long. Other people because I have no idea who they are. But even more difficult when you have a chance to introduce the goat. And I'm not talking about the beard. Um, my dear father, my teacher, mentor, professor, and inspiration, Dr. Phil Schneider is with us this morning and we are entering the month of May. May is a great month, it has my mom's birthday. Uh, somewhere in there is my birthday, uh, but more importantly for today's purposes, it's better speech and hearing month. So I thought it would be cool that this whole month, uh, all of our social media, the podcast, the weekly clubhouse on Wednesdays at 11 and the whole transcending stuttering community is pulling together to really open up our doors, open up our ears, and listen to the most important questions that you are thinking about. So if you're an SLP, a student, a parent, a teacher, an adult, a teen, and you've got a question, there's no question that's off the table, you can send any and all questions to schneiderspeech.com slash ask, and all month we're gonna to try to respond in different ways, again, on social media, the podcast, the clubhouse, um, but uh, without further ado, we've got a couple good questions lined up. These are questions that have come in. These are questions we hear on the phone all the time. These are questions we ask ourselves internally. And there's no one better than uh, the one and only Dr. Phil, the first, the original Dr. Phil. Uh, so Abba, thanks for, for gracing us with your presence this morning. Good to be here with you, Uri, always. Awesome. So Patty from Wisconsin, we'll kick it off with Patty. You know, she asked the question of how your professional work has evolved over the years, but let's roll that back to that story we were talking about before we went live, because I think that story is somewhat of um, inspiration and it really blends the spirit, the soul and the body, the science and the art all together. So if you could share that story about that girl uh, it has nothing to do with stuttering, but has everything to do with everything. Well, maybe it does have to do with everything. Thanks for asking me to share that. You brought my, you brought my head back. Um, in our lives, we go through all kinds of changes and they're not linear. Things happen and they're surprises. Um, after I finished my master's, I thought I was pretty smart, taking a course in stuttering and taking a course in voice. So I took a job with uh, multiply handicapped children. And uh, there was a girl in that school who uh, was about 12 years old and had no voice. And uh, meaning, I, I, according to what everybody said, she'd never been heard to sing, to, to cry, let alone to speak. And she was delightful. <clears throat> and it kind of puzzled me and drove me crazy. How could a person have no voice? She, uh, she was also blind. And um, I spoke to the principal who was working with her and he said, uh, nobody, she has no voice, work with the kids that you can help. But I couldn't get over it. So I, I found all kinds of ways to wind up spending a few minutes with her pretty much on a daily basis, doing all kinds of weird things. But basically we developed a fun relationship and I enjoyed being in her presence and she enjoyed mine. And we would tap rhythms on the table and sometimes tap rhythms on cheeks and uh, I was figuring out how could I figure out what's going on? And uh, so I looked in journals to see had anybody reported a case of a child that was never heard to speak or make a voice. And uh, I came across some articles <laughs> about vocal physiology from a professor at a local university. So I contacted him feeling maybe he'd have some answers. And he said, look, I'm not a therapist, I'm a scientist, but if you wanna bring her up to the college uh, uh, we will examine her so that my students see how to examine a person with a voice problem. And I scooted her up there without permission from anybody. And uh, he puffed some air in her throat. She coughed. He put a tongue depressor on the back of her tongue. She coughed and gagged and various such things. And he turned to me and said, uh, <clears throat> all the parts are there and they're working. Why she doesn't speak is your problem. Uh, I don't have a clue, good luck. And I was a combination of disappointed, angry, frustrated, scared, and empowered, in fact, by the fact that the, the great guru of vocal physiology had no clue. So I continued to do these things with her and then we moved on to 
doing things with our lips, making all kinds of sounds with air moving in our mouths. And I started that process with her in the fall and miraculously, she started to produce a little bit of a tone with some of these flutter exercises. And in the spring, she stood up and sang in the school show with a beautiful singing voice. She had not yet used her voice to speak. And my first reaction to, and I stood in the back of the room and I began to cry because I was just so overwhelmed with seeing something that apparently had not been there before, but suddenly it was birthed into the world miraculously. And I didn't really feel responsible. I never figured out the whys and the wherefores, but it, it struck me that something could occur that wasn't there before, that change is always a possibility beyond the imagination. And I never figured out why I was so determined to believe that something good could happen which was also strange. So I thought I changed the course of Gladys's life. But in fact, because of the relationship I formed with the professor at the university, he invited me to come and study vocal physiology as a doctoral student in his lab. And Gladys changed the course of my life. I spent the next five years as a doctoral student specializing in speech physiology. And it opened up a whole new career paths for me to be a professor, to be a researcher, to do all these things. And, so I realized the process of engaging with another person doesn't just change the other person, it changes us beyond our wildest dreams. So uh, I'm always watching out for those stories and every person that I meet becomes a potential next amazing story to change my life, and to change their life. And that's our work. We dive in, we don't have all the answers, but we, we go in with passion and with determination and with optimism. Amazing. So there's a, there's a little sneak peek. I don't think that story is on any of the documentaries yet. Uh, maybe it'll be on one of the prequels, the forthcoming ones. But uh, what would you say about, so that was early in your career. Patty was asking uh, this question about how your approach, and I think she was referring to specifically the work with stuttering, how has it uh, developed, evolved? If we look over the past, what is it, 45? 50 years. 70 years. 1971 was the first year I worked with a person who stuttered. In fact, it was the first time in my life I met a person who stuttered in any context. So it's 50 years and about 2,400 situations. 2,400 lives. Wow. So, yeah, over those 2,400 journeys, um, how have things evolved? Could you give us a little snippet? Compressed version. I think it relates years. back to, in some way, it relates back to the last the story about the girl with the voice issue. Um, in that, when we start out in this field, we feel it's a very linear, you know, you get your masters and you feel like I'm supposed to change the other person. I will tell them what to do. I'll tell them when they're doing it. I'll measure it. I'll reflect it. I'll reward them. Good, good, good job. Or here's a candy, whatever. And, uh, and we'll proceed along some linear path. And today I'll do it, you'll do it in this task and then I'll make the task a little more difficult and then a little more difficult and whether it's articulation, whether it's fluency, whether it's voice, I'm, I'm driving the car. And I think that, and I, and I have a certain recipe that's predetermined in my mind that I've learned, studied, been mentored on, put into my software, this is how we're gonna do it. And, and this is embedded in the way we train professionals. We write lesson plans where before I see you, I write down exactly what's gonna happen between us, how I'm gonna measure it, how you're gonna change and where you're gonna be next week. That has changed profoundly. Um, I realize now that, <clears throat> that the work is defined as an encounter between two people and it's very dynamic. And I'm not running the show, I'm part of, I'm providing an opportunity for this other person to safely talk about and explore issues in their lives related to speech, voice, fluency, articulation, what they notice, what their concerns are, what their fears are, what their dreams are, what their wishes are, what feels good to them, what doesn't feel good to them. And I define the journey through the word therapy, which means healing. Healing means you feel better and you function better. You're more capable of enjoying your life and of fulfilling your your missions in this world and you can feel more fulfilled. That's how I define the journey. And I don't have sort of a physical image of the end goal that's right or wrong. And if I did, I could wind up shaming people for being who they are and making the choices that they make. 
and having the issues that they have. Um, so in a way, it's a lot more relaxed because I don't feel like I'm on the line having to make something happen. If it doesn't happen, either I'm wrong or they're wrong, something's wrong. Not necessarily. Um, the, the circumstances that people wind up with are not necessarily have anything to do with their fault or causation or mine. And what is the absolute best way to handle it is different for each person and for each person at a different point in their lives. So it's a very flexible model. It's not predetermined. It has to be really focused on being responsive to the other person where they are in the very moment that you're there, knowing that at any other moment, millions of things can change. Their circumstances, their feelings about them, their thoughts, their ideas, and their physical skills. So it's a very, it's a process of being very responsive and welcoming and supportive. I guess the other thing is viewing issues as problems or brokenness, whether it's you don't articulate your R properly, there's something wrong with your R or your S, your tongue sticks out, there's something wrong with your S sound. Now I think of the work not as fixing things that are broken, but as polishing diamonds that are in people. And my job is to bring out the diamond and help them see it, enjoy it, polish it, honor it, use it to their best, to their best advantage and enjoy it. Um, and that diamond is gonna have a different shape and a different cut and a different shine for each person and for each person at different moments in time. So it's a very interactive, I guess the closest thing would be uh, client-centered therapy by Carl Rogers, as opposed to sort of the military approach. You know, I know the training, you will do it, I, you will fail or succeed. And the big issue underneath here is it's bad enough to have a problem. You can be shamed by the stuttering, but you could also be shamed and victimized by speech therapy. And speech therapy can become more punitive than dealing with the stuttering because you're not only now failing to speak without stuttering, but you're failing to fulfill the desire of the therapist and the parent if you're a youngster or an adult with the expectation of a society that you should be able to speak without those interruptions. So we have to go with a lot of sensitivity, a lot of love, a lot of listening. And as John Clausing, who I know you did a Conrad podcast with said to me, and it, it just stayed in my head, the customer is always right. So I remember distinctly when John did not want to come into the office when he was 10 and a half. And I said, if you don't want to come in, don't. Only do what you want to do. And that's going to be the story. And when I suggested he do something in the therapy that he didn't want to do, he said, I'm not going to do that. I said, great. I'm so glad that you told me because stuttering can make you feel like a victim. And if the process of therapy is not responsive to what you feel you want and don't want, then the therapy makes you feel like a victim all over again. So we have to help people feel that they have agency, the power of choice, the freedom to choose how they want to cope with their lives. A couple of thoughts. So coming off of that um, and in line with evolution and we've all had to adapt and respond, especially over the past year plus, but even before that, uh, not, not talking about approaches uh, in a pure way or in a rigid way, but there are things that you've also adopted and integrated into your practice uh, that range from the world of parent-child interaction, as well as things that, that draw from the LIDCOM program, which is a more behavioral approach working with preschool children. Um, do you wanna share a little bit about how you have integrated and brought different things into your work and, and what kind of resistance you had and how you've kind of woven it in in a way that sits well and, and seems to be more helpful and, uh, and safe. So I think that from a, a, an underlying kind of philosophy or belief system, I don't think any one person in the world has all the answers, but I think everybody has a little piece of the answer. So I, I try, and I've tried this more so and more so as I go along, and it's so easy to get rigid about what you think and how you function, but to try to take a taste on different things and sometimes even things that seem really aversive to you. So uh, I, I knew Woody Starkweather, I had not a lot of interactions with him and I really liked the idea of the demands and capacities model. It appealed to me, it seemed comfortable and not dangerous and it just, just felt like a comfy fit. So that's kind of where I began when, with my work with young children who stutter. And it involved teaching parents to modify their way of interacting with the child. 
to lower the communicative demand and so forth. And then for a number of years, uh, and as a professor, I was obligated to read everything that was out there and be on top of things. So I started reading all the data coming out of Mark Onslow's group in Australia, the Lidcom program. And the data were overwhelmingly amazing in the results they were showing, and it was very impressive. So I went to the seminars and I, I was not, I was negatively disposed to the idea of sort of a behavioral approach to telling a kid, nice smooth talking, that's bumpy, that's this, that's that. Very, seemed very confrontational and potentially negative and aversive. So I talked about it, I, I discussed it, but I didn't do it until some professional at a stuttering convention said to me, are you using that approach? And I said, no, and he said, why not? And I said, well, uh, he said, well, how could you have that feeling until you've tried it? So I found a way to go and watch some experts do it. And I found like, wow, this is looking in reality very different than it sounded on paper. I'll give it a try. And it wasn't too long into it that I realized, you know, the ideas that I had from the demands and capacities model were not aversive to the behavioral techniques from the Lidcom model. And why did one have to pledge allegiance to one thing or another, unless you were trying to create some research data and you needed to really control what people did. And that was not my investment. My investment was most, what's the most effective, positive way to help parents help their children. So I guess the first thing that smacked me in the face was that the therapist, the professional is not the therapist for the child. The parent is the therapist for the child. A mother and a father or a father, whoever the parent figures are, had the biggest impact on the child's life. So if whatever the work is, whatever the message that a person is sending this child about what's good behavior, what's not good behavior or whatever, is most powerful if it comes from the parent in their own environment. That had a profound impact on my work. I always had this idea, but it was Mark Onslow's work and his teaching that really said to me, you know, that is, that is really where the action is. And I shifted my work from my, whether it was an R sound we were working on, an S sound or a voice issue, the parent did not sit in a waiting room. The parent became the person I trained to be a therapist for the child. They know the child the best. They love the child the best. They'll do nothing hurtful to the child and I will guide them. So I moved into that model. <clears throat> and then the next thing with the fluency was the idea of a subjective rating scale with the parent keeping data and how that could help um, inform the conversation between the parent and the clinician and really steer things because it just provided a, a piece of material, uh, a substantial piece of material that you could use to guide the conversation as opposed to, I think it's better, I think it's worse, it's up and down, I don't know. So that tool became very helpful to me, again, in all parts of my work. So I started using the idea of a 10 minute special time and a day the non-special and having the parent make judgments in those two time frames and score those, and use those for the conversation about how their work is going with the child. So I guess the bigger rubric is stay open. There's always more to learn. We are never a finished product and the world is not a finished product. Um, and there'll be more things, God willing, as I keep doing the work that, that will change. Um, I'm gonna shift the conversation just a little bit because there's something right in here. Last year, last March, when this pandemic hit the world, uh, I closed down my physical office, and which I'd had for probably 35 years and loved my little cave, but it was pretty expensive to keep knowing that I would not be seeing people in that space. And being in my 70s, I felt like, it's okay, I'm retired, it's over. And, uh, and bit by bit, people would call me and say, you know, could you work with us somehow on the computer? And I'm going, how could you work with a person on a computer? But it was the same idea. It didn't feel good to me because I still prefer to go for a walk with a person side by side. I would prefer to be in the same space with Uri than be sharing a screen with Uri. Um, but again, you, sometimes you have to go from where your own resistance is to like, well, you know, maybe that could work. So honesty is always a principle. So I said, look, it's not a way that I've worked. If you wanna try it, let's see if it works for you. And we'll talk about it if it works for you. And I started meeting people on a computer screen, sitting in my apartment where I live. Uh, and you know what? It was not only as good, it was better. 
because that face to face is very intense and it's very hard to look away or to lose your focus even for a moment. So with adults and teenagers, with people who could voluntarily wanted to sit and talk to me, it became very easy and convenient. It cost less money, less time on their part, and we could do anything. And then there's something else that unfolded, which like just kind of like, boop, almost like an accident that occurred. I said, look, if you want to practice these things every day or so forth, you can send me a little video clip each day of your practicing for a minute or two so I can see how it's going. And you can send me a question you, and the video clips have time markers on them. So you can say, Phil, take a look at one minute point five. I tried to do that move that we were talking about in the office. I wanna show you how it looked here. Tell me what you think. I watched the clip, I hear their question. I tic-tac a few comments back to them. And now I'm in their home following up on their practice on a daily basis. And then it went one step further. Like, how could I work with a preschooler? You can't put that preschool that's in a chair in front of a computer screen. But what if the family films this child a couple of times in different settings in their home and in their yard and wherever with family at a meal table, playing in the area, playing a toy or a game. They send me those clips. I get a chance to see this child in action in their own home with their own stuff, with their own family members. And then as the work unfolds, let's say we're doing something between the Lidcomb kinds of ideas of behavioral input and maybe a little bit of modifying some of the communication style, parents start to send me these clips daily. So I know, so first of all, it means they have to do the work. They can't come in a week later and say, we did it once during the week because I'm looking for that clip every day. And again, they have their questions. I then respond to the clip to the parent through the WhatsApp and I use the same principles that Lidcom also taught me a principle. If you wanna make a critical comment, make positive comments first, far, far outweighing the number of critical ones. So I have to find three things that I like about what the parent does. And I say that back and I say, and by the way, on the next one, you might try just extending this a little bit more. Um, so now parents are getting daily support and the kid's getting his therapy embedded in his daily life from the parent. And I'm getting to support that parent in their home on a daily basis instead of, so we don't have the therapy and the carryover problem or the transfer problem. There is no transfer. The work is between the child and his family. That's the child's communication environment. So my work with preschoolers has gotten even better and I don't need to nail them to a chair in front of a computer screen. Um, and the, the other beautiful thing about the technology and the reason knows how resistant I am to move with the, with the times with technology is if the parent says to me, you know, I don't think I'm getting better at this. I'm not doing it right. The kid's not this. The kid, I said, let's scroll back in your WhatsApp because it keeps a chronological log and look at a session from two months ago. So we, and I'm not that organized. If I had all these videos lined up, I used to try to like find the video from like six months ago, put it in the machine, queue it up. Now we just have to push a little button on a cell phone and scroll with a, and flick a finger. So in many ways, I'm able to do more for people in less time with less effort. I don't have to have toys around because they have their own stuff and people are getting their needs met more efficiently. So that has, that's like the gladdest thing. It's a total surprise to me. Speaking of surprises, one of the things that I always got from you was that as much as you had the greatest teachers and professors, you always made it clear that your greatest teachers were the people you worked with, that you learned more from those 2,400 journeys and stories and the champions and parents behind them. So in that vein, a little surprise, we have Dan Greenwald's gonna pop in just for a few minutes. Dan is a good friend, old friend, and a person who stutters. And he's also a partner in this whole transcending stuttering project. So there he is live, from his office. Um, Dan, we've got you on a 90 degree turn. Okay, we'll turn this. We are live with, with the one and only Dr. Phil and the one and only bird watching, growth hacking man of the hour, Dan Greenwald. Please, please, please. Um, absolute pleasure to be here in the presence of Dr. Phil. Hi, Dr. Phil. Wish I were out there with you. Where are you? I'm right down the street from you. <laughs> I thought you were somewhere park. exotic. Good. Uh, so, um, Dan, what would you like to toss up? I, I said maybe you yes. might toss up a question, and then we'll, we'll toss you a question, perhaps. And then 
Uh, okay, good. Okay, good. So, so you know, Dr. Phil, you know, I've been gifted the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Iuri and really get my hands dirty, helping figuring out how to build off of, I think, your the concept of transcending stuttering. So what I have, what I have been thinking about is, you know, when you first had this idea, whatever many years ago, to where it is now, I'm wondering if you had an idea back in the day when you first kind of hatched it, launched it, where you think it was going to be going. And in like, you know, and also bring it up to where you thought it was going and where it's actually, where it is now and where you would like to see it going future from now. I can see why you help people grow and expand. Uh, that's a great set of questions. Um, I think my life works a little bit backwards. Uh, I remember a job interview for a professorship in a prestigious university. And I got through giving all the stages of the interview process. And the last one, they said to me, what's your five-year research plan? And I sat there and I, I stood up and I said, you got the wrong guy. And I walked out. It was over for me. Uh, so what happened with, the, with, the, with the, con the, the, the language of transcending stuttering, that, that phrase, which I still am extremely happy with, I feel very at home within that rubric. Um, I all, it's the last thing we said. I always knew that the, the wisdom of this issue and this challenge that people are faced with of stuttering lies within people who've lived and walked the journey. And I always felt, in, every time I'd sit down with you, I'd feel like I'm, I'm honored. And I remember wanting to sit with you and film your comments to learn from you, from your journey. How, how could I learn about what you're dealing with from a textbook or how to support, it's, it's ridiculous. So I always was addicted to filming these things. I probably started filming 40 something years ago and collecting those films, saving every inch of footage, which was a bit overwhelming. Um, and then I started to realize, you know, in that, in that probably about 3000 hours of footage that I had stored was somehow the wisdom of coping with this, of making peace with this, of whatever. And I wanted to tell the story in people's own voices and own words and own faces because I knew the wisdom was in there. And so I started just pecking through the film footage and writing down all the pearls of wisdom. So again, I didn't know what I would do with that. I didn't have a plan. I knew it wasn't academic. It wasn't gonna be a journal article. And it wasn't gonna be a textbook. And then it started to become clear to me it was a movie because it was people's voices and people's facial expressions, people's pain came across, people's victories came across, people's wisdom came across. And if they told their own story, and what if there were universal principles that crossed cultures and genders and age groups? So, and because I had film footage also of people over time in their lives, you could also see how life variables, biologic change, circumstantial change influenced this whole issue. So I started trying to put together which characters were, were best to make the point. And I also felt that in that process, the world could see articulate, bright people. And so the greatest negative stereotypes could be killed almost subconsciously just by realizing how bright and articulate and capable people are, yet they get stuck here and there when they're talking. So I started grabbing the stories that were most dynamic and then finding the, the comments that are most, again, no, no, no real sense of what I would do with that. And just writing index cards with all the pearls of wisdom. And then I became convinced it could be a movie and I'd never studied how to make a movie. And I talked to people and they said, you can't make a movie out of talking heads. And I said, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and I just became more and more determined and, pa and passionate about it. Um, and then I said, what is the name of this movie? What, what is the theme here? Is the theme fixing, curing, hiding, or going or being launched to transcend, to go beyond, to go above? And that the challenge itself causes to people to get stronger and better at being themselves. And that what looked like a curse could, in fact, in some cases, not that it's easy or pleasant or anybody would wish it on themselves or anyone else, no one wants challenge, but that challenge builds people builds character, it builds all the traits that you need to be successful in life. 
And so the, the word, I don't remember the first time the word transcend hit me, but I was looking for a word to capture that flavor of the challenge being the thing that launches people. Now, I, I never thought beyond the moment. Then I thought to myself, okay, here's the movie. Where does it belong? This was before the internet. And I said, it belongs on public broadcasting. And then I, so again, I'm always working back because I have the movie and I'm thinking, where does it belong? Then who do I know in public broadcasting? I know one guy who's a producer of Sesame Street. He'll get it on. He fails. I'm done. The doorman of my building, who's barely literate, sees me carrying the disc. He says, what's that? Come, I said, take it. He comes back and says, can I show it to my aunt? Show it to anybody. She likes it. Can she show it to people at work? Show it anywhere. Then he comes back and he says to me, uh, I said, where does your aunt work? She works at PBS. And two weeks later, the film was on public broadcasting. So if you'd asked me, where was it going? What was my dream of the future? I was working in the present and using the past to sharpen my present. I always knew I had enjoy being in your presence and respect and admire and was always inspired by your energy, your clarity of thought, your visions. Uh, did I know you would become part of the journey of in this way of my life? I, I never thought about that. Where could I, did I ever know that Uri would be, would do as my firstborn son, you know, would, would do this kind of stuff and do it the way he does and take it so far beyond anything I ever dreamed. No. So what's, so first of all, I couldn't be happier as a professional, as a human being, and as a father than not just to see what Uri has done, but to see the people he surrounded himself with and to see the way he nurtures relationships and that the practice that he's nurtured and grown is based on flavors of human values as opposed to profit. Yes, everybody needs to earn a living and that's good for doing good work, but what are the values that support that, that cause it to grow, that it's value driven and that you are a part of that is absolute. My only frustration with this journey is I don't spend more time with you. I miss you, but uh, so- We gotta change that. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe after we do the call, we'll, we'll set a time. Um, Excellent. So, I don't know what's next. Look, did I know there was going to be a pandemic and I'd be working in, in, in my apartment on a computer? So I didn't see that. Do I, would I ever, when that first happened, did I ever think that that would wind up being better than anything I'd done before? No way. Did I ever predict that I would have a doctoral degree or go and become an academic? I never had a dream of being a college teacher. So think, so who knows what's next? I'm open. That was great. That was great. Uh, um inspired in on you know on so so many levels i tell uri you know uri and i we talk all the time and um you know there's a concept of you know standing on the shoulders of like giants and what an incredible experience blessing i have as an offshoot of all that to kind of be standing on your shoulders a little bit and you know it's just such an it, it's it's such an exciting experience being a part of this and growing this and and seeing what mainly impact it's having on like other people and it's just it kind of propels it's a self-propelling concept and experience that it comes from you passed on it, it, it it's I'm very very excited about stuttering at a level that I've never even thought that I would even be entertaining or thinking this would be a big part of my life work now that I'm involved with. So it's, there's a lot of incredible grati uh, uh, gratitude coming your way and all of what you've done and laying a like, foundation for what seems to be no ceiling right now for the sake of helping create more and more guides out there in the world to help people transcend, move beyond their stutter. So thanks for, thanks for that response. <laughs> that really, that's, yeah. What were Thank you going to say? Dan. No, I, uh, I was interested if you were going to follow up on when you said that your life is more involved with stuttering. I, I lost the exact words of your thought. Yeah, I want to 
I want to, I want to, I'm going to, we both picked, I'm so happy that that was exactly what I picked up on, Abba. It was the same thing you picked up on. First of all, everything Dan said, you know, to stand on the shoulders of giants, to, uh, to just grow up around all these lessons and then to be a student in the classroom. When I posted today's event, Abba, somebody who I don't recognize yet said, please send your father my best. Today I teach anatomy and physiology standing on the desk, just like your dad did. And I said, do you do it with your shoes on or your shoes off? She says, I think I do it with my shoes off. Why do you ask? I said, don't you remember? You take the shoes off, you angle them on the edge of the table to show the movements of the arytenoids. But- um, Before, wait, I'm gonna just make a quick interruption. Yeah. This is for you, both of you, given what you said. But the idea of who's standing on whose shoulders, and you're both fathers, so you're seeing the next generation. So at this point, when they're first really small, they're big enough to sit up that you, you literally put them on your shoulders and run around and dance around with them on your shoulders. Then you reach a point where you dance with them holding hands side by side. And God willing, all goes well, you reach a point where you're on their shoulders. So it's not a linear process. And uh, you and Uri have pulled me along at levels that I would never have gone on my own. So it's, 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 a, it's a, it's a dynamic two-way street, and I guess in all good relationships, even intergenerational ones. Thanks, Abba. The highlight of the year was, was when you agreed for me to throw you up onto Zoom that first time and tens of people popped on and, and it was the engagement that you shared with those people and they shared with you that really gave you this next, uh, this next step, which couldn't have been planned. So to Dan's point, Dan, it would be interesting Look, as a as a 40 something year old father with the spirit that you have today, there's also the knowledge of the teenage kid and the school age kid who stutters and the experiences that you had related to that. And of course, there's this temptation as if, you know, you could just tell your 12 year old self all the lessons you've learned and all the insight and like that would just suddenly transform the 12 year old. But, but one of the things that comes through the film is the lifespan perspective that six-year-olds are not ready to do what 12-year-olds might be ready to do, and they're not ready to do what 18-year-olds might be ready to do, and they're not ready to do what a 40-year-old, 50-year-old can do. And I think that uh, with that with that insight, on the one hand, what do you wish you could tell yourself or could have known sooner? And at the same time, what do you think you were ready for or not, you know? Because you said how you couldn't have imagined being where you are today with this whole stuttering thing, you know, so, so many things pop into my head. The one, the one thing that it would have been really helpful to have heard or learned when I was 12, and I'm just going to go with that 12 year old because you could pick any age and I could give you experiences of stuttering the specific people who didn't, who triggered the, oh man. I'm not going to forget you for saying that. So I have every single age of experiential of stuttering. But the one thing that I wish I heard that I'm living and I get, I'm gifted the opportunity to share it with a lot of other stutterers and other people now is the idea of fear equals opportunity. Mm. The idea of this concept of this like courage muscle, the idea that every time we choose intentionally to lean into something versus human nature running away from it, usually from shame. Each time we choose to lean in, we're building another strand of that the courage muscle. And every their best self that they perceive about themselves. So stutterers, us stutterers, almost have a step up on most other people because we can't most of us can't really hide our stutter so we're faced with that you know fork in the road of be truth each time we choose to lean in versus run away we we add another level another uh, strand of that courage muscle and the idea of the stronger the courage muscle the stronger we are to face and deal with the heavy bigness of life. And sometimes we know what that is. Sometimes often we don't know what that is. Life gives us a heavy dose of, oh man, life is really short. What do you do? 
if you don't have a strong courage muscle, you sometimes can get flattened by that. However, fear equals opportunity. Stutterers, the sooner we could understand that, if I was 12 and heard that, I'd be like, wait, you're saying each time I'm faced with running or staying in and showing my courage, showing myself, uh, showing myself courage, I would be able, capable of doing more quicker, younger, bigger, better, more later. That, 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 that's, 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 I think the thing that I would have liked to have heard. And I'm trying to rectify that by doing it now. I love that term courage muscle. I never thought about it. And I could just see, see the muscle fibers growing stronger and adding more layers. Wow. That uh, definitely resonates with a lot of people. So Dan, I know you had a short window, but uh, as long as you can stay, it's great, but thank you. And there are some folks here that are, are commenting away specifically on some of the things you just said, Dan. And I just want to acknowledge Tom Scharstein, who is uh, a real ally and friend and an extraordinary guy in Florida. And he has put together through this crazy year, some extraordinary world stuttering network. And this Saturday, he's lined up 20 hours called the Stutter Fest. Um, I look forward to capping that off uh, at the end of, of Saturday, after the Sabbath, of course. But um, there's a great lineup. Dan, others, I, I recommend everybody check it out. So the World Stuttering Network lineup. But just back to you, um, Abba, same question I asked Dan. So Trudy from England is asking, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your clinical career? If you could go back and tell yourself something you wish you, you know now that you wish you knew then. My, my, my real first thought goes to um, my job as a professor. Uh, I can remember my teaching. And I, I remember each year feeling like I wanted to go back and apologize to the students from the previous year because uh, I started my, that career thinking it was about information. And I, I did courses that were content-based. So we talked about this muscle and this muscle and stuff. And I realized that preparing for this work is more about inspiration than information. You need the information, but you need a reason to want to know it and understand it. You need to see where it fits in the human journey. So I think that I find that as opportunities to speak to younger professionals, people coming in to become our colleagues, I talk more about stories of people that I've met who are challenged and who found ways to transcend those challenges and how we acted as an agent. So I'm less invested in the world of numbers uh, and more invested in the world of souls and feelings. And uh, I'd have to say, if, if I wish I had known the, the phrase courage muscle and been able to talk about that, um, I first heard something related to it. It's in the, in the, it's in the Transcending Stuttering movie where Michael Levin says, the harder it is to, to, to do it, the more something you get every time you do, the stronger you get every time you do. And, and so he actually took the whole thing of difficulty and challenge and turned it on its head and said exactly what Dan said in a little bit different language. But uh, I wish that was my first lesson in, in graduate school, preparing to become a professional. Um, but actually I'm more grateful than anything else that I started out not having any formal training in stuttering therapy and, and starting with the first person I met and saying, like, I don't know anything about it, you teach me. So that kind of, came naturally and it came from a point of, at that point I felt kind of embarrassed and ashamed that I didn't know anything. I thought I should, because you're supposed to, the therapist is supposed to have the answers. I don't believe that anymore. And because of the circumstances, I just kind of like realized it because I had no choice. I, I didn't know what to do. And here I saw somebody exhibiting extraordinary behavior. So I just reinforced, go back and say, it's better to not know and to care than to think you know and be a little bit hard, uh, insensitive. So just to try to squeeze all this rich opportunity that we have here with um, people I love very, very much. Uh, it's wonderful seeing the questions and, and feedback flowing in. Um, just as a reference, if you wanna see the Transcending Stuttering documentary and the sequel Going With The Flow, um, there's also a lesser known 40 minute 
lecture version, which is basically all the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor where my father shares the story of this first teacher, this child, Michael, who was his first uh, teacher, meaning the first case where my dad walked into the room to help a young person who stutters and he didn't know what he was doing. And the young person basically said, get out of here, you know, <laughs> go help somebody else and how my father responded and the next story. So those are all available at schneiderspeech.com slash movies. But I want to pivot into Abba some very practical things that with all your experience, you could kind of filter back because people are very interested to hear. How do you decide for parents of young kids when to do something and when to just give it some time? Um, how do you bring that professional wisdom and care to kind of stack the cards in, in favor of uh, the child's outcomes and so on. And at the same time, but th whatever that means, sometimes that might mean being more more active and getting involved. Sometimes it might be parents doing some work and, and leaving the child out of it. And at the other hand, sometimes just enjoying what is. What are your thoughts in terms of guiding parents through that or your own deciding factors in those? I think the first thing to, to clarify is that that question is coming from a parent that parent has a dilemma, it's something that looks like it's broken, not working right in their kid's life, his kid, her kid's life. And it, it, it strikes them that either something neurologic has broken or something psychologically has broken and that this thing could in some way impair the quality of life of this child and limit its potential. And this scares the, scares the parent a great deal because a, a, any reasonable parent feels consciously, unconsciously, it's their job to keep this child safe from harm and help them nurture their potential to have a rich, full life of relationships and of contribution to the world. And this difficulty speaking, which suddenly emerges, threatens that dream. And they have a big problem. What should they do about it or not do about it? What should they say? What should they not say? So it's very scary. It's scary because maybe it represents a, a sign of a, or a symptom of some underlying pathology. And it's very scary because it represents the opportunity to cut this child off from social relationships and from contributions in the world. And it's very scary because it's hard to understand what to do and what not to do and find simple advice. I mean, if it's a bacterial infection, you know it's gonna be an antibiotic. It's pretty straightforward. If it's a bone break, you need someone to set the bone and protect it. And, uh, so, you know, it's kind of like, this is what's broken. This is how it gets fixed. It's, it seems more clear cut. The stuttering thing is very strange because it's like it was developed, the speech was developing well, and now all of a sudden it seems like it broke. Uh, it's also very hard to come to grips with because it's changing every day and every moment. There are moments when it's completely not there and there are moments when it seems rather, rather significant and large. It's also difficult because we have no cause and no etiology. We don't know what it really is still in the world. So professionals are kind of confused and the parent gets mixed messages. And because of that, we have these different treatment ideas, which many of them have some good pieces to them and maybe a good fit and some not a good fit. So it's a really scary time for the parents. So when I get that call and the parents say, I don't know what to do. I don't know if we should talk to the kid about it. If we should talk to you about it, if we should be in therapy, not be in therapy. To me, my job is very clear at that moment. It's to help this parent find their way through this dilemma and to feel supported that they're not alone. And so that first phone call, they have to know, like, I really care. I'm not really sure just from the conversation what's best. You know this child better than anybody else. I am very devoted to these kinds of issues and have been around the block with them. Let's spend some time talking it out together. And in today's world, as I said before, you can send me a bunch of videos so I can see your child. And we'll set up a time to speak for an hour so we can really talk about the details of what's going on. And if you think it's really a great idea to include your kid, you know, talk to me about that. If you think it's a good idea not to, talk to me about it. You know your child and, and your concerns that you're raising are because you're sensitive and concerned. And, and you're absolutely right to be concerned. The pledge of a healthcare professional is number one, do no harm. Number two, try to do some good. And I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna play out, but let's send me some material so I can get to see your child in their own home in different settings, different circumstances. 
then let's sit down and you can really educate me about your child. And then together, gently and carefully, we'll go one step at a time, always listening to what your perception, always watching what the child's feelings are. If, if it seems to make you feel better, the time that we spend together, you start to feel more calm and more focused as to what's healthy. As we see that what we're doing is making your kid feel better and function better, we move forward. If we feel anything for you or for your child is aversive, we're going to stop and talk about that. And, and, and go slowly and think about whether we're going to continue. And one of the things that's different about my work than, than the models that I grew up on is I don't believe a linear model. Like just because we decided to meet for our first meeting today doesn't mean we're going to meet every week for the rest of life. Like we'll start going and if it takes us in the right direction, we'll tickle it and we'll twist, we'll tweak it. And if it's not doing anything or God forbid something worse than nothing, We'll pull back because mature, a child is not a static entity. A child grows up, a, child, a, a little baby becomes a toddler, a toddler becomes a preschooler, a preschooler becomes a school-age child, a school-age child becomes a latency and an, and an adolescent, and then a young adult, and then a mature adult, and then an old adult. And each of those things brings change, anatomy, physiology, psychosocial perspective, and life experience. So the whole dynamic keeps changing. So we're not gonna, we're, we're going to start slowly and gently, and you're going to be a full part of the equation. And together, we'll go safely and be careful to protect the well-being of your child, who's the biggest interest to you. And the goal will be not only will your child, God willing, feel better and be able to speak with greater ease, but you're going to feel like you were part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, that, and even so though right now that feels scary, I'm going to support you in a very close way. And together, we can do this. I think that's so important. Uh, two two things to highlight: one practical tip, and then a follow up question. And that might be our last question for today. But drop your questions. We will try to circle back, and, and my dad will make some shorter video clips to address the outstanding questions. And over the whole month, please feel free to send your questions to SchneiderSpeech.com/ask. A S K. This month is May Better Speech and Hearing Month. Uh, so the whole month, we really want to take questions. So generally, people throw a lot of information. And as you said, the work, both as a professional, but also for a parent, for a young person and a young person, information doesn't solve human experiences, generally. It, 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 you know, We need to have human solutions and to tap into both the body and the spirit. And I think parents often feel they need to know what's the right thing to do. And there's no right thing, you know, it's a combination of what's going on, what's the experience of their child and what's their way of dealing with it. So the tip I sometimes use off of your starting point, I'll ask a parent in that first conversation, what's your best hope? What are you hoping I'll say? Because they're asking kind of sitting at the edge of a cliff of some sort, hoping the answer is, I hope he'll be willing to help me. I hope he won't be another one who tells me I'm worried about nothing. Just give it time and just wait and see. Or maybe they're sitting at the edge saying, I think my kid is really fine. I hope they'll tell me he's just fine. Now, I don't know, but sometimes I'll ask them that. And then I'll ask, and what's your greatest concern? And in that way, those questions sometimes help me get to some of the underlying feelings and thoughts that are going through the mind, because I know that the same question can mean very different things. You know, hey, doc, what should we do? Sounds like a simple question, but it's, it's not. And we need to understand where people are coming from. So I just would love your input. What do you do when parents have this concern? If we talk about it, if we decide to do something about it, might we make the child aware? And might we give them a complex of a uh, bad self-image and somehow harm the child. Um, on the other hand, the parent is saying, I wanna do something about this. How do, you, how do you approach that? What are your thoughts on that? What age child are you visualizing? Three, four, five, six. Let's go with the three, four, maybe five. One of the things that I learned from Mark Onslow and his Lidcom group and their approach, which is very helpful with this is, better not to have a whole sit down with a four-year-old or a three-year-old and explain what we're doing and so forth and so on. It's a very adult kind of cognitive model. And there's no harm in talking about what's great. 
saying, hey, that's great. Hey, that's great. If you were teaching baseball or violin or kicking a ball or any skill to a child, you'd say, hey, you did that great. And if you did enough of that, you did that great. You might say, oops. And then they might go back to that. Yeah, whoa, you, you got, that's the way. So it's really positive feedback about learning a skill. There's nothing evil in that. That's a normal part of a child's growing up experience, looking to the parents, actually wanting, needing that feedback and that steering in an appropriate way. So number one, the feedback is not overwhelmingly negative. It's overwhelmingly positive. And it's gradually steering the child to, to behavior that's healthier and, and more comfortable for them without a discussion about it. You want to teach a child to ride a bicycle, it's time to take off the training wheels. You don't give a lecture on how gravity or gravity and centripetal force will keep the bike up and so forth. You don't give a physics lecture. You just take it on and you hold the seat and you start to run with them. And then pretty soon gradually you let go and you let go and you say, good, 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 good. And then they start to feel the confidence that it works. It's, it's, an, it's an, a physiological experience. It's not a cognitive verbal conversation. Those conversations are a problem. So I agree that it might not be good to sit your kid down and say, look, if you keep talking like this, life's gonna be difficult. So you should start working on it. You know, that's like not a good package. So I think that uh, there are ways to not, there are ways to be very direct in a very positive way that it becomes a sign of pride and capability instead of a feeling of shame and disability. Uh, so that's my answer. And, and even with a- language, language makes a world of difference. Both if you're dealing with a six-year-old or a seven-year-old and you say, you know, what I, if I'm introducing myself to this child now, it's on a Zoom or whatever, I say, you know, my work in this world is helping people be, become great talkers. And you are already a great talker. I see you love to talk. And I love listening to you. You have all these interesting questions and thoughts to share and you have so much enthusiasm. These are the traits of great talkers. Another thing a lot of great talkers do is sometimes they go a little bit quieter and then they get a little bit louder. And sometimes they go a little faster and sometimes they put in a few more spaces. So, so if we play with those things, we can take your great skill at being a great talker, which is a gift and make it even greater. So you can talk the, about it, but positively. The simplicity and the subtlety is, is profound. There's a comment here that really captures the whole thing, Abba, uh, Katrina says, as a student, this conversation has been so eye-opening and inspiring. I can't thank you enough. I'll be taking this forward in my therapeutic experiences. What a beautiful perspective. And for those of you that know, for those of you that don't, um, my father has not only been involved in the lives of 2,000 plus people who stutter, but has had a part, undergrad, grad, workshops, uh, engaging, training, influencing, and then of course through the film Transcending Stuttering and Going with the Flow, touching the lives of therapists around the world. And if we can all continue to come back to what really matters and make it really human, bring the humanity back into the room, both looking at people who come in looking for guidance and support and direction, as well as those of us that are in the position to be the guides, to recognize our humanity, our vulnerability, our limitations, but also our strength. And it doesn't come from textbooks uh, filling our minds, overflowing with within information. You got to lead with heart. You got to lead with lead with humanity. Uh, so I just want to thank my father for this time, and again encourage people to drop your questions. And uh, the podcast is transcending stuttering. This conversation is a great one. Some of the people my father talked about have been on the podcast. You can you can meet some of them: John Clausing, uh, Jonathan Costello. Uh, and so many others. So it's been a big treat to share this time with you. Please send us your comments and feedback so we can continue to come back with, with relevant opportunities to learn and to listen from some of the greats. But today was especially remarkable to hear from my father, Dr. Phil Schneider. And I thank you, Abba, and thank everybody for joining us. Do you want to leave us with, with one parting wisdom? I feel like you've got some kernel that you wanted to share. Two, two statements. One is gratitude to Uri because my experience here parallels so much of what we're talking about, which is I didn't think I had much to say. And Uri had the faith to say, I think you have something to say, come on the show, we'll, we'll, it'll come out. So sometimes you, you don't even know what's inside of you until you let it come out. 
And the second comment is to, for those of us, I guess for all of us, whoever we are, professional, parent, individual with stuttering, follow your heart. Think of what you want to bring into your life and get to it. Like Dan said to me, oh, you said you'd like to spend more time. Let's schedule it and do it. So that should be the way we all lead our lives. Thank you so much for sharing this time. Thank you again, everybody. And you can follow everything on social and schneiderspeech.com slash TSA. Uh, you can sign up for emails and follow what we have to do for speech therapists and for people who stutter. And most of all, just enjoy talking and, and being yourself. Wishing everybody a great day. And remember to check out the World Stuttering Network Stutterfest this weekend. Um, it's an amazing opportunity, 20 hours of hearing some of the great leaders, people who stutter, researchers, clinicians from around the world. But thanks to Tom Sharstein and everybody over the World Stuttering Network. All right, we can do a lot more together. Everybody have a great day.